is a true legend, a true actor or an actor, I guess. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Williams. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. And I'm particularly... I'm right here. I'm here. If I fall over, it's a really good picture. Uh, and a, a, a dear friend of mine, Jason Alexander, has, uh, has made the trip. The trip from... Where do you live, Jason? Where, where, where in L.A. do you live? Uh, you don't need to know that. <laughs> he lives in the upper reaches of L.A. And he drove down here at, nine, at, at uh, 5 in the, in the evening at the height. I mean, oh, you know, wow. uh, like terrible things happen. You want to know the truth? Like the Hamas and stuff like that. Oh. All you have to do is get him in the car. And start in Los Angeles to drive down here. They'll say, if you give you any information you want, it's so torturous. Okay, the legend was spoke. <laughs> so, we were so excited to have you here and when you agreed to come. And actually, I'm an interview. So, the big question, of course, was who's going to interview you? And our first thought was, we well, are not worthy. <laughs> <laughs> but, we found someone who was more than worthy, another superstar on stage and screen. Uh, and between the two, you have won every single award there is on this planet. I mean, really. So, ladies and gentlemen, the very talented Jason Alexander. <laughs> <laughs> Jason and me is that I needed a hand to get up out of that sofa and use a bomb. Oh, I sprang right up. Uh, I was sitting in, in the muscles. Prius before. Uh, <laughs> Prius, it was so long, the battery didn't make it. I had to go to the fuel. It was so long. That's the latest game. I think it was for yeah. the game that were, for, I did No, I'm spontaneous. <laughs> then I come up with this stuff. Uh, however, the, the questions I'm going to ask you today, I actually sat and thought about them, and I wrote them down. Uh, we won't need that. We, we're, we have so much to inquire. We have so many things. And I've seen this. Now, you haven't seen the documentary yet, right? You have. Yes. Have you all? No. Oh. Uh, Jason, Jason, that's what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, usually if you and a follows the motion picture, but we do things differently. When you're, when you're with Bill Shatner, you do things differently. Oh. Uh, <laughs> How many hours did it take you to get down here? <laughs> well, I, 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 I had a driver. You had a driver. But, but, but because we're so, I don't know what the right words would be, commanding or insecure. Yeah. When there's a driver, yeah, excuse me, I think you should go in the next lane. Yeah. Why don't you speed up a little? Sure. I mean, you're constantly doing backseat driving, sure, because he's not driving exactly the way you are. Right. And let's face it, you, you so I put it in a starship across the universe, and I think, <laughs> you know, I gotta ignore you know, the driver who's probably better at it than you are. You guys just gotta ignore him. So I would read, I you would read it. With, I can't do that. I, uh, I, I, the only time I ever get nauseous is drive, is reading in a, in a car. I can't read in a car. Uh, you don't get nauseous looking at anything I'm doing on the screen? <laughs> no, I get inspired and you know that. Yeah. Uh. It's so true. Uh, uh, you know, you know, I'm interviewing you, just I'll tell you when you talk. <laughs> you know what's, it, what is disturbing <laughs> is, you know, we're used to the audience, not, I don't know, everyone's alert, but they're lying down. Yeah, we got people in an audience yeah. lying down. Yeah, I think I've had that experience. I've had the experience of people in seats getting up and leaving. Sure, but I've never had the experience of them. They're here for a period of time. They, they, they don't care if the film plays or not. This is eating from this row. It's very very. Yeah, you know, they're eating and drinking and holding hands. Right. And it's just, yeah, are these crimes? Um, 
So just, uh, and I'm going to ask him some questions. This is, by the way, the worst microphone I've ever worked with. No, this one here is the worst one. Yeah, okay. Um, the reason we're so far apart is my wife has COVID. I don't. And my wife doesn't. Right. Oh. So I'm standing six feet apart under the illusion that I can't get my hair over to him. Um, he got me into college. He got me into college as an acting major at Boston University because uh, oh, wow. he doesn't know he gets why I told him the story, but he doesn't know how he did it. And the way that he did it is, I'm just going to go, the way that he did it, oh, thank you. The way that he did it was, um, I never knew anything about acting, and I discovered Star Trek when I was nine years old, ten years old, and a oh, yeah. large part of the reason <laughs> that I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be, I wanted to do exactly what he was doing, and I knew nothing about acting, and so I, at one point, I knew just about every line of all 70 plus Are years. Are you serious? Years. Yeah. You, you knew the middle of the line? Oh, absolutely. And I could say them all with, you know, at any given time. What are you doing now? No, no, no. What is that thing? <laughs> so don't do that. To get into college, I had to do a, 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 a monologue, a dramatic monologue, and I did the first monologue from Equus, the opening monologue of the psychiatrist as the Equus. With the horse. Yes, and I've never had an acting lesson, so I channel my, my mentor, and I go, the one particular horse called the E. Embrace <laughs> Yeah, I'll take this cheek into a sweaty brown and stand in the dark for an hour. Like, Jeez, that's compelling. It's not bad, right? <laughs> so I do this monologue, and the gentleman, the professor uh, at the university, stands up and says, you know, um, I have no idea if you're if you're a good actor or a bad actor, but that is one of the finest Bill Shatner impersonations. <laughs> and I'm intrigued, and that's how I got into the school. Now it turns out that that gentleman's name was William Lacey, and you may not remember him. I do. I do remember Bill Lacey and Bill Shatner did Shakespeare together. Yeah, but and you know when they were you were being beautiful. The 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 fact of the matter is, you don't know how talented this gentleman is. He's not only a great comic, but he's a great dramatic actor. But he sings. He's musical. He's a musical a comedy actor. And he could play a, anything in the music. And he's mighty talented. And I'm uh, Stop. just... Stop. Uh, Wait, you're embarrassing. I mean, finish your thought. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't want to talk to you. I'm not going to talk to you. I'm not going to ask you. These are big, big, walking places. So his wife has COVID. That's why this is part of Yeah. That's why we're, we're separate. So I watched the, uh, as always, and I'm not kidding, you always fascinated me. I watched the documentary and I had a wonderful time. Uh, so these are questions that were inspired by the documentary, but not necessarily from it. What is, in your opinion, sir, a life well lived? Um, well, that's a complex question. Um, and, you know, there are many uh, pools to sit from, to sit from in telling that story. For example, I'm, I'm putting together two speeches. One is on when the, in, in April, when the uh, eclipse, the solar eclipse is on. I'm going to be in front of 100,000 people saying something. What am I going to say? Prior, uh, 15 minutes before the eclipse, I'm going to say something. They said, say something. So I'm going to try to put together the beginning of the universe and boiling it down to this moment in time in Indiana when we're all looking at an at a event, a celestial event that is 12 billion years old and maybe older because we don't know what happened during the intervening 12 billion light years. What I'm saying is there's a whole history of life and knowledge and the acquisition of that knowledge is part of what compels me. So the life well lived is the acquisition of like the banyan, not the banyan tree, the, the tree in the garden. 
or the banyan tree in uh, in Lahaina. The magic of nature, to know the mystery of the things that exist in nature, to be aware of the mystery, to be aware of all that, the sky, the earth, the, 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 the awe of, of existence. If you stay aware, primed all the time, the beauty of having an old friend talk to me, and be aware of how grateful I am that you're here, that we're talking in front of a group of people who are listening because they're here to listen. It's a meaningful moment. The life well lived is being aware of every moment that you can. Not to let a moment slip by. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, I, 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 more and more, I, more and more, 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 I understand. Here's what's scary. As I get older, I understand him more and more. <laughs> he makes more and more sense to me. Um, when you look at your career, what do you think? Are you, are you proud? Did you miss something? Um, are you the actor and storyteller and the observer that you wanted to be? Do you look back with it and go, yeah, I, I, I got there and I did it, or I did it sporadically, or there's something I wish I could have added that I didn't want? Well, I tell you, Jason, and I wonder if you feel the same way. I've, I've gotten really, I, I'm doing a show called The Unexplained, right now. It's, it, 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 one person. That's really good. Uh, but for me, the unexplained is a real exercise in approaching something fresh. Like it's an aberration. I'm, I'm on camera, but it's also voiceover. So you could, like I hear it. Really. And uh, on 1940, uh, the ship came into the, you know. But in what I'm doing is in 1840, the ship came in. And you're involved in it. You're in, you're indigenously into. So that was what I must have been striving for all my acting life. I started six years of age. The camp play was about Nazis. And they wrote a speech for the six-year-old child to say, I have no idea the, the implications of what I was saying. But apparently I was leaving home and I had to leave. Nazis are coming, I have to go and say goodbye to my dog. When the curtain went down and went up, the audience comprised of people from Europe who had just come over after the war were crying. Wow, I'm making people cry. And my father came up uh, later. My boy did, gave me love. And in that moment, I became an actor. In that, in that instant, in that flash, in that flash of, and I, I vividly remember it. Can't read me. I'm dancing. It's my boy. It's my boy Bill. And, and, uh, and the audience cried. And I strived with little success to begin with. But more and more as I began to think, what am I doing? What have I done? That was terrible. I got Trying to improve all the time. Trying to reach that place where you and the words are one, where there's no separation between what you're saying and what you're feeling and what your intention is and what the character's intention is. I mean, if you're playing somebody with a different mental set than you, you've got to be playing that different mental set. But if you can live it and if you can breathe it, and that's what I am trying to do with not as much success as I would like to, but the older I've gotten, the better I'm getting at it. Because you know, this is, I mean, I'm just reacting to what you said. One of the things that I admire about what you do as an actor, and why I found it inspirational, you have guts. I mean, you commit to choices one of the things that was astonishing to me, because I really am a, a student of, of the original Star Trek series, there were episodes that were kind of goofy. 
And I, and I think of myself, if I were the actor on the set and they handed me these pages, I'd go, come on, guys, really? The Rock, I'm going to talk to The Rock and the, and, the, and the Lizard Man and have this speech. And... But your commitment to the possibility of the drama in those moments and the possibility of what is this man who's committed his life to exploration and, and communication and connection to these races and beings and possibilities called for a performance that would swing to the fences. And in doing so, you more often than not, as far as I'm concerned, elevated material that was okay and made it spectacular. And I can give you a great, I mean, it's a well-written speech, but the one that you probably hear often is the risk is our business speech. If you look at that on the page, there's not a ton there. There's not a lot of things that an actor would go, oh, I'm going to make this choice and that choice, and the intention is this, and the thing is that. But the reason I think all of us that know that speech know it so well is because you found choices and connections and intentions and were pulled by them but it required a level of commitment to the truth of those words that I and most actors I know would have looked at and gone, can I, can I take this down a little bit? Can I play this a little closer to the best? You, you never allowed yourself to run away from that. I, I was uh, in great demand as a storyteller at a B'nai B'rith uh, camp where I was a counselor probably about 17 or 18 years old. And the kids in the camp were 10, 11, 12, 13, who had seen their parents and their relatives massacred, sliced open, shot. These were kids that you couldn't fool around. These were killer kids. These kids could be killers. Their emotions had been so hammered and so toughened by the life they had led being so young. And the only command I had over these kids who were only five, six years younger than I was the telltale heart. The man is buried in the ground, but he's not dead. This is in the blackened camper bunk. They're all in bed. And I think the man is the storyteller. So they thought, 
well, let's put in the next generation gas. They'll they'll be bigger. As it turned out, they made a hundred million dollars too. But they were paying their actors three, four, five times more than they paid us. Um, what was the question? <laughs> Does Kirk represent so well? So, I came off of playing Alexander the Great uh, just prior to Star Trek. I had been, I studied about Alexander. He's one of my favorite people in history. His legendary, he was 18, 19 when he started the campaign. His father had been king uh, of Macedonia. And now this young, young athlete with this alleged this is horse that he, uh, what's the name of the horse? Bucephalus. What was it? Bucephalus. Bucephalus. So Bucephalus was a horse that was afraid of its shadow, and he knows that. So he brought that horse into the sun so he could avoid seeing his shadow and trained this horse so he became his war horse. He was a legend. And yet you could understand him. And I was, I had somewhere heard of the phrase, the look of eagles. He had the look of eagles. Absolutely. He was staring into the future. And I brought that with me to Captain Kirk. I, I didn't do it deliberately, but I had been a Shakespearean actor for several years, and I had this rhythm of speech that, and, and a view of a role where you are committed. The language, Shakespeare language, doesn't lend itself to reality necessarily. It lends itself to a heightened reality. And that's the way I played the Shakespeare, with a heightened reality. So it was, you know, once more, into the three dear friends, once more. So once more to the bridge of your bridge, it's gone. So that commitment to Shakespeare, to Alexander, flowed into those early years of Star Trek. And that's what I was bringing. The, the rhythm of the speech, the commitment to grander language, making the language a little richer, than Little Richard. <laughs> but when you look back on her, are you proud? Is that, is that what you wanted him to be? Did he shape the way you wanted him to be? You know, I, 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 I'm making a lot of albums. Uh, the first album I made was Decca Records so many years ago, asked me to uh, do an album. So I said, all right, I'll do an album with the concept of the album I want to make is literature and song. I want to link the literature when you write new music to it. So, using uh, the speech I can remember best, once more, uh, 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 to be or not to be. To be or not, or not to be. That's the question. Whether it's no that speech. With the music written under it, segues into the song. It was a very good year. It was a very good year. I was 21. And then I was 21. And it, so the contrast between literature and music and the lack of contrast, the, 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 the identity of both, which is rhythm and music, the onomatopoeia of English is music, and, and, and music is usually written to the sound of the words anyway. So, if you, if you know, uh, the hills are alive. You, you can't say the hills are alive with the sound of music other than with that, that rhythm and that, and that the melody. That's what I was striving for. So, there's a speech by Cyril de Bergerac, which uh, ends, I may climb to no great heights, but I will climb a lot segues into a drug song. It's a temporary man. It's a temporary man. It's a temporary man. I get on a Johnny Carson show and the producer says, after the rehearsal, he says, that's 
six minutes. You can only do three. You want to do the song? Me? You want to do the literature? I want the song is sexier. All right, here's Mick Jagger with his new album. Mr. Jagger, read, man! And Johnny Carson's like, what the fuck? <laughs> I never, that was a commitment. That was life. I mean, it became the butt of many jokes. But I never stopped knowing that I had something in the lyricism and the melodic line of words that could be made into music. And I've made many albums trying to perfect it. I did a new album, a children's album now that I'm writing with uh, Robert, Sh uh, Robert Sharno and, and Dan Hill. And uh, we've got a children's album. Um, termites, elephants and termites. Elephants and termites. It's a children's album, 6 to 12. What the hell's that? Elephants on the plains of Africa, where there are no trees, walk around, and in these prairies of grass, the termites build their towers. Twelve feet high, masticate the mud, and they've got really complex air-conditioned turrets with millions of termites in them. And the elephants have an itchy behind them. So they'll walk up to you know, and go, oh, you know, it's so good, and destroy the, the, the mound. The mound has a, a glue-like mud. So the elephants trample it and, and make a little depression, the rain comes, and the depression gets a little larger, gets a little larger, gets a little larger, gets a little larger, and finally gets a watering hole. Fish from eggs that uh, birds flew over, dropped the egg, fish, crocodiles, animals from all over the, 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 the land of the forest come to water from elephants and termites. And we made it into a song. <laughs> I'm singing elephants and termites. It's a children's but it's so beautiful. I've evolved through that laughter through that little oh shit, maybe I should stop. I refused to stop because there was things I, I saw that I felt. And and this children's album has got to be fantastic. Got to be the, 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 whatever it is, the flag of my singing career. <laughs> and when I say singing career, I look at you with your beautiful voice. It's me trying to make music I studied singing for a while, I really couldn't sing. And I I, and I, I listened with awe at the voices that sing like yours. I'm like, God, to be able to do that. God bless you. I will give a million dollars to charity if anyone can tell me how he just answered my question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I, I, well, I, mean, I will, I will take journeys with you wherever you want to go. Alright, my final question and then we're going to let you Yes. Um, uh, I have, I see no foreseeable end to you, but I will remind us all, you are 92 years old. Oh, no, no. And that's the way to show that the rumor was finished. <laughs> You talk about this briefly in the film, and I don't, I don't want to drag you into something you repeat, but uh, somebody said, you know what's so horrible about death? The party is over. And then I heard Christopher Hutchins said, no, it's worse than that. The yeah. party keeps going. It's <laughs> just not invited anymore. <laughs> um, I'm 64, and I find that my relationship to the notion of death and dying has become more curious, uh, more comfortable, less frightened, less fearful. I want to be here for a whole bunch of reasons. And I and you know the one thing we never think of is oh we're gonna we're gonna die today. I remember when Lin Manuel Miranda, who wrote Hamilton, discovered uh, Hamilton's diary, 
and on the day that Burr killed him, it, it, in the diary it said, uh, 7 a.m. Uh, duel with Burr in New Jersey, 11 o'clock uh, breakfast with someone. So he didn't go out to die that day. <laughs> oh my Lord. So we're never prepared, we never see it coming. But we're all going to get there. Where are you with the notion of the end? Well, I'm obviously like everybody else, I'm confused. When the scene came to Dias Kirk, Kirk, like that lizard thing, was always, oh, look at that. Ooh, great animal. I wonder the real oh, I wonder what it does. So I thought he would greet death in the same way. I'm having such a good life. My wife, my kids, my life, my, my creative life, my inner life. Horses, the dogs, friends, talking with you. It's so joyful. I don't want to leave. I don't want to go. That's what I Peter Phil and I, who have known Bill forever, uh, do a podcast that Bill was lovely enough to come on to, where we explore things that make us go, really? What? Really? And, you know, we, we started with a snarky premise when we had Bill on, which was a 90-something-year-old man went into space without benefit of, you know, a, a, a medical person or training of any kind. So we thought, that's a good idea. Let's shoot a, you know, a 90-year-old guy into space and see what happens. Um, but it became, the episode became about the fact that he accomplishes more in a week than most of us can imagine doing in a year. This, this unbelievable drive and energy and curiosity makes him one of the most fascinating people in the world. And I will finish this up by saying, um, I'm not kidding and I'm not going to get teary about this. When I was a nine and ten year old boy, I was a little lost child. I was lonely. I was scared. I was bullied. I didn't know who or what I wanted to be or what life would hold. I watched a performance by this man and went, I think maybe I could rise to that. It was aspirational. Bill was given to me by my best friends on my 35th birthday. I had never met him before. He showed up at a restaurant and said, Hi, I'm your president. And gave me some of the best advice I ever had about how to treat celebrity and success. Um, some great attitudes about life, and he has been kind enough to keep me a part of his life ever since. I cannot believe I sit here as a 64 year old man, not that nine year old boy who dreamt about what it would be like to meet him and be able to call him a friend. I call you a friend. You continue to be an inspiration. And what you're about to see is a man who is in process thinking about everything in life in ways that most of us cannot put the pieces together on. I think you will find it fascinating. I adore you. I give you a big kiss on the mouth, but my wife has COVID. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I can just go away. Thank you so much. So you, you, the generosity you've shown here, and my, yeah, you know, I feel such warmth towards you, and both of you. It's just, just uh, I, I'm so grateful. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, this is Newport Beach, Los Angeles Times, and this beautiful new port 